Thank you very much. I appreciate you all coming out and the invitation to speak with you today um, on this Monday where all eyes are on state government over at the legislature with regards to this uh, special session of all special sessions, it seems. Let's hope that it, it ends today and doesn't continue. Over the past several months, I think all the state agencies, including ours, have been eyeing our budgets with what our concerns are and what's at risk. For us, the reality of risk falls into two categories, in museums and elections. For many years, our office has been diligently preparing for this fiscal cliff by dealing with our museum system and reducing the footprint um, over, the, um, over the state. Returning many of our sites to local control, like Chenault Aviation Museum in Ruston, we've supported sites such as Cotton Museum that sought local funding through the ad valorem taxes to effectively take them off of the state's books. And we've looked for ways to shutter facilities that were not robust historical sites with frequent visitors, such as the exhibit at Jean Lafitte and a location in Livingston Parish was just simply on the books, but not in existence. But despite all those efforts, our remaining museums are very much at risk. In Shreveport, we risk shuttering the Louisiana State Exhibit Museum, a Smithsonian affiliate museum that includes priceless dioramas and ancient artifacts. Right here in Baton Rouge, just blocks away, we risk closing the doors of the old state capitol, the jewel in our town, and a landmark not only for the city, but for the state, so rich in history. To me, those aren't small risks. In my opinion, they are big risks, big consequences that won't go unnoticed by the taxpayers across this state. But what is most at risk and really keeps me awake at night are our elections. The RFP committee is scheduled to hear oral presentations from three voting machine um, companies in hopes of beginning to replace our aging equipment. Our plan is to replace approximately 10,000 voting machines on uh, early voting machines and election day machines beginning this year um, and finishing out at sometime around 2020. Congress released for Louisiana $5.8 million of new funding for this endeavor, but we do have to come up with our match. Additionally, a half million dollars that our office has in self-generated dollars pieced together with $1.5 million uh, approved by the legislature last um, session, not last regular session, but the previous regular session. Uh, that along with about three million that is proposed in the coming fiscal year, if it survives, um, will give us a decent amount of money to begin this process. That adds up to around $10 million, uh, which will not fully cover this uh, endeavor. This endeavor, we believe, will cost anywhere from 45 to $60 million total, but we should see the details of that as the RFP is let. But let's set aside the budget for now. The Secretary of State's office is an incredible place. It is an office that is focused, that has um, tremendous at work ethic by its employees. We are wonderful folks who have customer service as the priority. And we have been an incredibly stable and reliable office with a razor sharp focus. We emerged out of our recent turmoil and are returning to our routine activities focused on the fundamentals and the basic services we provide for the people of Louisiana each and every day. As the new Secretary of State, I've embraced the cliche that you don't always have to choose when you lead, but you do get to choose how you lead. This is not where I thought I would be th just three months ago, but I'm energized by the challenge that faces our office. I quickly assembled a team that I believe stands out uh, with talent and trust and strong character and a history of experience second to none. I've chosen former, Secret former Speaker of the House, Joe Salter, who has agreed to serve as my first assistant. Stepping into that role is at the heart of our organization. 
Not only does he have the stellar reputation among all in state government, he is a man who has led the, in his entire career as an educator, a lawmaker, and a family man. Joe will undoubtedly keep us on track as we focus on our top priorities. Next, I made a big ask of someone who has worked a very long time in our agency and closely with me the entire time that I've been in the office. Promoting her required her to park her civil service position, which is, as we all know, a very big protection in state government. She agreed to do so, and I'm thrilled to have Shonda Jones as our Undersecretary of Management and Finance. Shonda has worked in accounting and budgeting and knows our operations backwards and forwards, always with an eye on the bottom line. Her um, previous position was Director of Accounting, and prior to that, she, to coming to the Secretary of State's office, she worked in the Legislative Fiscal Office. So she's no stranger to the numbers. She is critical to our operation to continue to navigate these tight budget cycles as well as the purchase of new voting equipment. Finally, I promoted Meg Casper Sundstrom to Deputy Secretary of Communications and Outreach. Most of you in the room know Meg and her knowledge of our office. This team is the reason the Secretary of State's office has flourished to date. They work with each staff member and every day in order to accomplish the big wins that we've been able to accomplish. More than three million voters are now registered in our state for the first time ever. 30,000 more Louisianians participated in the presidential election cycle than in 2012. 14 parishes in our state are now doing commercial filings through GoBiz completely online. We have added layers of security to reduce business fraud and identity theft. Our state archives has been highlighted on genealogy programs like Who Do You Think You Are? And we are actively looking for a new state archivist to bring that area into the 21st century of record storage and retention. No wonder there are so many politicians wanting to seek this office. Who wouldn't want to inherit a fine operation as this? As you can appreciate, change is never easy at the top. Many have asked me sincerely to reconsider running for the office because it would eliminate the risk of derailing some incredibly important initiatives and work that we have deemed critical. I respond like I have from day one. The work we have ahead of us in the short term is too important and too intense to run for the office. My focus is to run the office in the manner of which I've always been taught with honor and integrity, fierceness, and razor sharp focus. I believe that all I have is worthy of me continuing the efforts that we began just a short time ago. An office in which candidates should stretch well beyond the typical political platforms of God, guns, and patriotism is how people should run for this office. Voters need to be asking candidates the tough things about running for this office. They should be asking about voting machine security, hacking, automatic voter registration, felons running for office, voter fraud, and the age-old too many elections. The list could go on, but those are the significant issues that face this office. So what's at risk? Self-governance. Confidence in our outcome of elections, the foundation of our democracy. Louisiana's history has defined how we run our elections as it has in most states across the country. In 1952, Governor Robert Kennan decided Louisiana's reputation for corrupt politics and shady elections had to change. During his first year in office, he secured money to purchase voting machines in every parish to ensure the integrity of the vote. No more ballot boxes in the river. And the privacy and secrecy of each voter's choices could be assured. Secretary of State Wade O. Martin was given $1.5 million, just $1.5 million, to purchase the latest models. They were massive devices that weighed over 1,000 pounds each. Can you just imagine refrigerators as voting machines? But they brought Louisiana into the forefront of election integrity. You may hear from candidates running this fall that other states do elections differently. No doubt about that. 
In Colorado, for instance, their mountainous terrain, blizzards and ice storms make voting by mail a much easier and safer task than voting in person. But back here in Louisiana, our history of ir voting irregularities, possibly dead people voting, led us to value the combination of voting machines, voting in person, photo ID, and preventing fraud. In other states like Oregon, every single registered voter receives a mail ballot for every election, whether they plan to vote or not. While the criticism for printing costs is obvious as an election official, I immediately question the confidence in chain of custody for those ballots. How do you know the ballot was ever actually delivered to the voter? How do you know the voter was able to vote the ballot without influence of others? How can secrecy of the ballots be maintained? And how do you know that all voted ballots have been received and not stolen, misplaced, or even worse, destroyed? In terms of election fraud in our state, we see the most complaints surrounding the improper use of paper ballots. So this gives me pause. Those who pursue paper ballots or choose that as the new technology, when in fact it's the technology of the 1800s, I question, are they really considering Louisiana's history? Do they really understand where the new technology is taking them? It can take days, if not weeks, to count paper ballots. Does anyone remember Florida and hanging chads? Many states are quite envious that Louisiana produces unofficial results within hours of the polls closing. Yet, in paper ballot states, it takes weeks to finish counting the votes. Can you imagine Louisiana's people waiting weeks to find out the results of a tight election without questioning the very results of that election? Any changes to the fundamental way in which we conduct elections in our great state will undoubtedly have unintended consequences. Our systems, policies, and procedures are considered some of the top in the nation. We adhere to seven out of eight best practices when it comes to cybersecurity, and we'll score eight out of eight once we have our new system in place. Remember, Wade O. Morton was given $1.5 million to purchase the first machines back in 1952. Today's price tag is between $45 and $60 million as an estimate. But compare that to replacing our current machines, which would run closer to $150 million. I think we're about to invest good money for a good process. Another area in which the Secretary of State's office can be better stewards of limited taxpayer dollars is in terms of the number of elections held in our state. Am I wrong or does it seem like we are always having an election? We did a study back in 2010 and found that between 2005 and 2010, Louisiana held 70 elections. That ranked us number one in the South for the number of times we went to the polls. At least we were number one. Almost half of those elections were special elections just to fill unexpired terms. Almost half of those were legislators alone. As a result, in 2011, special elections in January and June were eliminated from the election calendar. And in 2014, we eliminated the ability of local governments to schedule tax elections anytime they wanted. This has helped our statistics, and we've been successful in cutting the number of special elections. But all in all, whoever takes over this office in seven months has a fantastic staff and organization awaiting their leadership. We are seeking someone who embodies fairness. It is critical to running this office and serving as chief elections officer to be fair and impartial. To have fair and secure elections, everyone must work together. Yes, that means Republicans, Democrats, and independents and for those who choose no party. We all need fair and secure elections to secure, continue to secure our democracy and for our state to thrive. Do not take the election for Secretary of State lightly. Do not let the candidates get by with platitudes and promises. You should ask the tough questions, get to the topics that this office can affect, and make sure 
that the con we continue the tradition of electing a Secretary of State who is focused fairness, customer service, and integrity. If we can elect someone to lead this office in that manner, then all Louisianians win in November or December. Thank you, and I'll take questions now. If I can have a sip of water. <laughs> We estimate the new machines, the new technology, because it's going to be machines and software together. We expect it to be somewhere in the neighborhood between 45 and 60 million dollars. But it sounds like in the best case scenario, you've got you're looking at about 10 million now. How do you get between 10 and 45 to 60 million now? Without well, I'm glad you say that. We continue to offer solutions to that, uh, but we haven't gotten the legislature to buy into those um, solutions just yet. Um, but we're working on it, and we'll continue to work on it. Kyle, could you repeat the question as you get it? So my, my bad, and it, it's written right here. Not okay. The question was, <laughs> the question was, repeat the uh, the cost for the um, the new equipment. We estimate between forty-five and sixty million dollars. And then the second part of the question is, you, know, you at best we're going to have ten million dollars moving into the to the new fiscal year. Um, how do we? How do we deal with that? Our real goal is to phase this in over a five-year period, um, shorter if we can obtain the funding. We have proposed some solutions um, to the administration and to the legislature, but we have yet for them to, to bite on those solutions just yet. But we hope to get there. Would you replace the, the uh, early voting machines first, or would that be part of the, the The question is, would you replace the early voting machines first? Uh, and then move to election day equi uh, equipment, and the answer is yes. Um, the early voting machines are, um, although they're the newest machines, they are the latest technology in terms of touch, um, I, um, touch equipment. Um, and the reality of that is those wear down faster than the, the big election day machines. And so we need to begin that process. I have I've told the legislature, uh, and the administration um, all throughout the session that we needed to begin that this fall at uh, uh, but the latest needs to be the spring our goal is to begin replacing those at least in five parishes if we're able to get the full 10 million um, begin that process in the fall um, if I'm not able to get all of that then I'm gonna have to look at other options because I do think we need it, some parishes need some new machines to to replace some of the ones that are giving us trouble. Yes, sir. Now, are there been any instances of uh, overseas or in, inside the United States attempts to hack the, your system? Have there been any um, overseas attempts to hack our system or in-state efforts to hack our system? Um, let me break that down into two parts. One. The election day, whether it's early voting or election day itself, is not online. So that is unhackable. The election registration system is online, but has a lot of uh, firewall protections and other protections that we've put in place and continue to monitor on a regular basis. I'm very proud to say that we've engaged the Department of Homeland Security in uh, looking at our system, and to date, we have had no issues uh, that they see to our system. Um, we, before the federal government ever got involved and created critical infrastructure for elections, we were already utilizing third parties to monitor our system for any attempts to infiltrate. Um, we are very proud of our online voter registration system, and with that comes threats. But we are able to, cr we created a system to where they're not actually, although they're registering online, it is not delving directly into our system. It is parked on another system and then our registrars go and retrieve that data in a secure manner. Uh, we are constantly working with um, all parties involved. Um, we just did a, a, a test on uh, fishing expedition with it internally. Um, to keep our people on their toes, to make sure that they realize that there's always someone looking to be a bad actor in this process. 
what type of attacks have they had in other states? How do people try to influence the voting process? What the question is, what kind of attacks have they had in other states, and how are they trying to influence the um, election outcome? Interestingly enough, the reality of the hacking phenomenon is the Russians are trying to infiltrate the electioneering process in terms of political campaigns. They are focusing their efforts on social media in terms of trying to um, affect people's opinions about candidates and trying to turn the election one way or the other. The reality of hacking the election system, really there was an attempt successfully, I believe in two states, Illinois and Arizona, um, where there was some sort of uh, breach in their registration system. Um, one of those ended up being an internal issue, I think that was Illinois and Arizona. Um, there were no changes, although it was infiltrated, there were no real changes to the registration system. And I think that's the, the part that we are watching out for the most part um, as a high priority is that we don't want people to feel like their registration is at risk. Um, God knows we have been through enough in terms of fighting issues with having to, to uh, almost be forced to release private data from the court system, but we are not willing and we're very adamant about with the presidential commission not to give up private data from our citizens if they wanted the normal commercial list that people uh, purchase on a regular basis for their political operations they could purchase it too and i will tell you go on record the white house paid five thousand dollars like anyone else for the entire list of registered voters in the state of louisiana by credit card by the way yes sir The question, if I'm, I'm um, repeating it correctly, is the assumption is that registration is down and therefore um, part election participation is down. And what is our outreach department going to do about that? The good news is our registration is up. The bad news is our participation is down. There's really been no correlation anywhere that I recall reading that puts registration and uh, um, and election turnout together. We, we've had the most registration in the history of the state of Louisiana and yet people still decide not to participate and I think we ended up in the low teens for, um, made for our uh, treasurer's race turnout. It really depends on what's on the ballot, uh, what's generating people. A lot more local issues generate people to the polls than do statewide. The, except the presidential election, which we have consistently increased turnout on the presidential election for the last two cycles. Um, one of few states to do that. The question is, did I understand you to say that the, you could get up to $3 million in the new budget as it stands today? As it's, <laughs> depending on what hour it is today, probably so. But uh, last time I checked, uh, as of last night, yes, the $3 million was in there for additional funding for new voting technology. Yes, ma'am. Karen says that the question is, uh, for example, Representative Gene Reynolds is resigning his seat and it, as soon as it's vacated, will that election be held in the fall or does the legislature get to call its own special elections? <coughs> Multifaceted, the fact of the matter is the legislature can call an election for any seat that is vacated at any time they choose to do so. 
but I give credit to uh, Representative Speaker Bara, who previously served on the House and, uh, House and Governmental Affairs Committee and worked with us on reducing special elections. He's been very sensitive to that issue. And then the couple of times that um, President Lario um, has had to call special elections, he too has been very um, supportive of our efforts to reduce special elections. They've done their very best to tie it to an already called election, which is either in the spring or the fall. But unfortunately, um, there's been cases where we've been unable to get them elected and seated in enough time to represent the, the people that need representation. So we've had a, a couple of February um, elections. Um, but for the most part, um, I suspect and hope and look forward to working with uh, Speaker Byra to get those special elections called for on the fall ballot as with the Secretary of State's office and the congressional elections. Yes, sir. What, what is the average cost of the election special election? Average cost of the, a statewide special election is uh, right at $6 million, um, which I think could go a long way in the budget process. Um, I think one thing that the next secretary uh, should look at is, uh, for example, the treasurer's race had the first assistant who succeeded um, Senator, now Senator Kennedy, had been able to stay in there until the next regularly called statewide election, we would have saved 5.8 to $6 million. I think that the next the next secretary should look at a, the possibility of passing a constitutional amendment to allow that individual who by constitution takes that seat, much like I do, to allow that individual to stay in the position until another statewide election is already called, which is typically the gubernatorial or the congressional. So we're looking at two years max at any time. Um, this would have been the case for this seat right now where the congressional election is being held in the fall and therefore um, it's a statewide election so there's no additional cost to the state for that one. Uh, Dr. Rathbun, uh, what's the percentage of early voting and has that continued to go up as the novelty uh, uh, kind of wore off? What is the percentage of early voting and has that continued to go up and has the novelty worn off? The novelty has not worn off. Uh, we are up to, uh, on a given election, 26% of those voting are typically done through early voting. That's the highest percentage that we've had to this date. Um, what we have found is just because the numbers increase on early voting does not necessarily mean the numbers increase overall uh, turnout. And um, what we're seeing is your chronic, chronic voters tend to turn out on early voting because it's convenient. Um, and I will tell you, under the previous House Bill 1 that the governor vetoed, we were very concerned as to whether or not we were going to be able to actually support early voting uh, in the state. We're, the Secretary of State's office is responsible for um, five early voting sites across the state by law. And so we're fully staffing those, and those were in jeopardy. So depending upon what happens today, I'm very concerned about election and early voting for the budget. Yes, ma'am. How will this office and other agencies will fight um, issues of sexual harassment um, that have come up. Um, I can tell you under my leadership, um, prior, just prior to the secretary leaving, I signed into effect a new sexual harassment um, policy uh, without his input, without his participation, and we did so by taking what the legislature was um, considering and we took the governor's task force and we melded those into the policy we already had. Um, I think it's a very robust policy. Uh, it includes additional training beyond the minimum that is required already for employees and we hold everyone accountable for reporting improper behavior uh, and not just supervisors. So. Um, I think what what we have looked at and will continue to look at 
is ways that we can improve the environment of people reporting things that they see, whether or not they are the object of that situation. And I think that um, with the additional in-person training that we're requiring of supervisors, I think that's going to go a long way um, to solving some of the issues that we saw. Yes, ma'am. Well, the, the good news there is, I'm sorry, I have, so the question is you haven't mentioned commercial filings um, very much and um, with that uh, portion of our agency where all we accept all commercial filings, um, how is that being affected by the budget? Um, all of that is supported by self-generated revenues, um, fees that are collected for those filings. Um, we are in the process of working with the Department of Economic Development to bring them on board to our GoBiz portal. Um, they are portions that they want to be able to access in terms of communicating with new businesses, uh, opportunities for financial assistance um, or grants, either from the state or the federal government to assist new businesses and new entrepreneurs. So we're very much embracing that. Um, we feel very confident in how it's working and has been working with the Department of Revenue and um, workforce. Um, it's been very robust for all three agencies and um, we've gotten a lot of um, customer feedback in terms of the system is working well, uh, easy to use, and um, people are very confident that um, their, their information is protected as best as possible. Um, one additional thing I want to plug in there is that we, in, we encourage every business to file for our notification system so that if anything is filed on their business, whether they filed it or not, they're given an alert so that they can go in and check their, their data and make sure that no one has compromised it. Yes, sir. a long one to repeat. Um, I think in essence the question is has there been any vision for um, creating a statewide coalition for multiculturalism in terms of museums um, not only for African Americans but for uh, other cultures uh, and a vision for bringing that all together in Louisiana. Did I sum that up? Okay. No vision uh, although I would endorse such a vision, no vision in, this, in the Secretary of State's office. Um, our goal is to continue to reduce our, our footprint with these local museums um, and to protect the two uh, big ones, the Louisiana State Exhibit Museum and the um, Old State Capitol. And, and I go back in history on this because the reason why the Old State Capitol and Louisiana State Exhibit Museum are inside the Secretary of State's office is because of neglect from the other system that was housed under the Lieutenant Governor, and I don't remember who the Lieutenant Governor was, and obviously it was because of budgetary issues. Um, 
So if I can protect those two jewels of Louisiana, one in Shreveport and obviously one here in Baton Rouge, uh, then my goal is, is to do that. Um, and to work with these other small ones to go back to some sort of local control or local financial support. Uh, but I would support that idea and I'd urge you to bring that to the Lieutenant Governor, who I think is really more in his mission in terms of cultural recreation and tourism. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh. Right. Uh, you anticipate facilitating a, a uh, larger view of their contribution and Louisiana history at the existing museum that you see? I think we can certainly explore that. Um, I, I certainly believe that if you go to the Shreveport, the uh, Louisiana State Exhibit Museum in Shreveport, it is a more all-encompassing history of the state of Louisiana, which probably will play a very strong role. Then I also think we could look at exhibits that we could do also at the old state capitol that bring in, because as you well know, I mean, that's a historic uh, monument to, you know, the Civil War and the Union soldiers, you know, uh, stayed there and ended up burning it down. And I think there's a lot of history that we need to talk about on both sides of the issue. And I think that's a possibility that we could do there, some sort of exhibit there. But I don't think we should ever harness or um, I should, I should say close down any sort of debate on the importance of multiculturalism in the state of Louisiana and the contributions of all citizens to our, our rich history and to the moving of Louisiana forward. So I look forward to working with you on that idea and we'll work with our, our two museum directors in the north and, and here in Baton Rouge to do that. I think there was one question I think we're supposed to end. My current, um, the question is, what is my current budget at this point in time and what is the legislature considering for it? My current budget um, at this point in time for this year, it, for the coming year, um, I'm sorry, this year it was around 75 million, give or take. Um, it was that low because we didn't anticipate a statewide, statewide election. So then I ended up having to ask for, the uh, previous secretary asked for a supplemental to, to pay for that. Um, the next budget, uh, because of the congressional, we've requested around 84, $85 million to cover it. Um, the history of this office in terms of budget, I think you would see that we're relatively stable. It may look like we weren't stable um, during the, the previous eight years, the previous administration. Um, because there were a lot of means of financing swap um, where they utilized self-generated rather than state general fund and switched that around all to make the, the books look a little bit different but the reality is that our office has not gotten much off of the 70 mid 70s range to the mid 80s range